The Cellar. Emily Hartridge was born on the 25th of May, 1984, in Hambledon, Hampshire, England. Emily grew up with multiple sisters and had a dream of growing up and being on TV. She was described as always being an entertainer, and on February 5th of 2007, she created her first YouTube channel. Her channel would lay dormant until August of 2011 when she would upload her first video titled A Long Weekend in Berlin. This first video of hers was primarily a vlog style video documenting her travels through the German city. Uh, we're just walking along a Berlin street called Hein something Blinnem Straßen I don't know what it's called but it's pretty. So we've been in Berlin for about four hours. We sat on the bed, we walked around, and now we're drinking German wine, which is actually surprisingly really nice. Following this initial video, Emily would begin uploading a different style of content, her 10 Reasons Why videos. These videos would basically be Emily coming up with a subject, sometimes topics considered controversial, and then she would give her 10 reasons why she felt a specific way about each topic. The more Emily uploaded, the more her videos and channel started to take off. It was clear that Emily had quite the sense of humor, and those that discovered her content were quick to keep coming back for more. Emily's channel really started taking off when she started diving into topics that were sexual in nature. Videos like You Should Have Sex Every Day, 10 Reasons Why, and Women Watch Porn, 10 Reasons Why, would garner thousands and sometimes millions of views. Her most popular video ever was titled You Should Have Sex With Your Ex, 10 Reasons Why. This video would eventually break 20 million views and currently sits at 26 million views this very day. Hello everyone and welcome back to 10 Reasons Why. Sorry again for not doing a video last week. I'm not going to lie. I was doing this. And this. And a lot of this. 10 reasons why you should sleep with your ex. One, it's easy. You're both going through a dry spell. You're both still single. You both know where each other lives. Simple. Hi. 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 How are you doing? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. How are you? Yeah. No. Uh, no. Good. Um, good. You. You're. You're good. Everything's good. Yeah. It's. Oh, it's quite cold outside. It's cold. Yeah. It is. Uh, so what? What have you eaten today? Uh, had Anything? some. Should we go to the bedroom? Yeah. Yeah. It was easy at this point to see why Emily was garnering a ton of support on YouTube. She had a very open, candid, and fun personality. She wasn't afraid to tackle topics that a lot of people are afraid to explore. Her lighthearted and funny personality really pulled you in, and you couldn't help but feel like you were watching someone who was truly genuine. There are a lot of creators out there that come across as fake, to put it as bluntly as I can. But Emily was not one of those creators. When you watched her content, you truly felt like she was opening a window and allowing you into her life, for better or for worse. Eventually, Emily's channel would break the 100,000 subscriber mark, followed shortly by 200,000 and then 300,000 subscribers. Her success on YouTube would eventually lead to television producers looking to hire her to be a presenter. Being on TV was a dream that Emily had from a young age, and her YouTube career was opening up doors to her achieving said dreams. Emily would eventually accept a position as a celebrity interviewer, where she would go on to interview the likes of Russell Brand and Hugh Jackman. Do it again, Emily. <laughs> this is going super Rock of Ages is a type of a film. No, they're not for you, just those. I'm keeping these, no. this, this is all I've ever wanted. These. <laughs> <laughs> Don't throw them back at me! Oh my god! I'm gonna have one of them now. <laughs> she would continue uploading on YouTube, where she would open up to the public about everything. 
discussing her secrets, insecurities, and the overall ups and downs of her life. Emily was a real person talking about real problems, and those that tuned into her channel really appreciated the open and honest conversations that Emily would have. This now brings us to the last video that Emily would ever upload. The video was titled 10 Reasons to Get a Younger Boyfriend. In the video, Emily and her boyfriend, who is roughly 8 years younger than her, dive into the numerous reasons why having a younger boyfriend was great. What no one knew at the time was that one portion of this video would be directly connected to Emily's future demise. In the video, Emily's boyfriend gifts her two scooters. I will play that portion of the video for you now. All the younger guys I've dated have been more romantic than the older ones. I don't care if they're doing it to try and impress me. I like it. Ready, baby? Yeah. One sec. Okay. Happy birthday. Oh my god, two scooters! <laughs> yeah, you know that. Why'd you get me two? Well, this one's a six. It's got your name on it. And then this is the one you can use to work. It's all electric and apparently the best one in the game. Oh my god, that's oh, no. so cool. <laughs> yeah. Now we will jump to July 12th of 2019. Emily was riding her electric scooter on the Queen's Circus Roundabout in Battersea, London. She was on her way to a fertility clinic at the time when she suddenly lost control of the scooter. As she attempted to regain control, she would veer out in front of a massive truck. The truck had no time to react as it drove straight into Emily, ending her life right then and there. At the time, Emily was only 35 years old. Her death would come as an absolute shock, with numerous news outlets picking up the story, and even YouTube released a statement stating, we are deeply saddened to learn about the tragic loss of a truly talented British creator, Emily Hartridge. Our thoughts and condolences go out to all her loved ones and fans. Following this unbelievable tragedy, in September of 2020, a coroner ruled that Hartridge had lost control of her scooter due to it being unsuitably driven too fast and with an underinflated tire. Emily Hartridge is believed to be the first person to die in the United Kingdom in an accident involving an e-scooter. Emily's boyfriend would later state that he absolutely regretted ever buying her that electric scooter. I can only imagine the pain and guilt he feels over the situation. But he never could have known what would happen, and I hope he has been able to find some peace within as it truly wasn't his fault. At the end of the day, Emily Hartridge was a young and talented creator who had so much more life left ahead of her. Her infectious personality will forever be missed, and I want to send my deepest condolences out to all her friends, family, and supporters. Emily, you will be missed. Joseph Arity was born on April 29, 1915, in Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo is situated at the joining of the Arkansas River and Fountain Creek. It is 112 miles or 180 kilometers south of the Colorado State Capitol in Denver. Joseph was born to parents Mary and Henry Arity. Mary and Henry had arrived in Colorado in 1909 from Petras, Greece. In search of work, Henry took a job within a steel mill located in Pueblo. The couple did not speak English at the time, and they were first cousins from Barosha, a village in Mount Lebanon, Mutasarife, Syria. Joseph Aridi was the eldest of the couple's three children. It's said that Joseph was nonverbal for the first five years of his life. As he continued to grow older, he began speaking in very short, simple sentences. As he grew into an adult, he typically did not speak to anyone unless he was spoken to first. When Joseph was sent to elementary school, his time there was cut very short, as after only one year, the principal told Joseph's parents that he needed to stay home. His reasoning was that Joseph simply could not learn. In October of 1925, Joseph would be admitted to the State Home and Training School for Mental Defectives in Grand Junction, Colorado. At the time, Joseph was only 10 years old. While attending the home, the Arity family was brought in to undergo psych tests. Those tests concluded that his mother, Mary, was feeble-minded, and his brother, George, was considered a high moron. These were terms used to describe those with mental handicaps back in the early 1900s. 
That now takes us to September 17th of 1929. Joseph Arity was S assaulted by a group of teen boys. I won't get into all the gritty details, but it was a horrible situation. And during the altercation, Joseph's juvenile probation officer walked in on the scene. He would write up a complaint letter to the school's superintendent, but ultimately the entire situation was misrepresented as consensual in nature. In his report, he also stated that Joseph was one of the worst mental defective cases he had ever seen, claiming he was a moral danger to society. The way people viewed and treated those like Joseph back then was terrible, to put it simply. Joseph's time at the school going forward involved him being beat up and abused. That was until August of 1936. At 21 years old, Joseph Arity left the school grounds with four other young men. They stowed away in freight carts and traveled through Colorado and Utah for several weeks before ending up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. In Wyoming, Joseph would eventually walk up to a kitchen car where he asked workers for some much needed food. The supervisors, Mr. and Mrs. Glenn Gibson, would allow Joseph to stay with the crew. They gave him clean clothes and allowed him to work as a dishwasher. He would work all day in order to earn food to survive. This lasted for about six days as the train car was heading out of state. Joseph was not officially an employee and thus the Gibsons told Joseph that he could not go with them. They drove him back to the rail yard in Cheyenne, Wyoming. That now takes us to August 14, 1936. Two girls of the Drain family would be attacked while fast asleep within their home in Pueblo, Colorado. Both 15-year-old Dorothy and her 12-year-old sister Barbara Drain were hit by an intruder with a hatchet. Dorothy was essayed and would end up losing her life as a result of the attack, while Barbara ended up surviving the ordeal. Following this incident, a fellow runaway from Joseph's school would tell workers that he and Joseph had passed through Pueblo in the late hours of August 16th, but according to the boy, Joseph never left the rail yard and soon proceeded to get on a train to Denver, Colorado. On the night of August 26th, 1936, Joseph Arity was arrested by two railroad detectives for vagrancy in Cheyenne, Wyoming. At the time, Joseph was caught wandering around the rail yards. He was soon brought to jail, where he was questioned by the Laramie County Sheriff, George Carroll. George knew of the search for suspects in the Drain murder case. And while questioning Joseph, it was revealed that he had traveled through Pueblo. George began questioning Joseph about the Drain case, and according to George Carroll, Joseph confessed his guilt to him. George Carroll would soon contact the Pueblo police chief. He then proceeded to contact the local press, who reported the news the next morning, naming Joseph Arity as the sole perpetrator in the Drain Girls' attack. In February of 1937, the case against Joseph would be taken to trial. Joseph's lawyer pleaded insanity to avoid the death penalty for his client. During the case, George Carroll testified in court that Arity was mentally fit and fully aware of his actions stating as well that Joseph was articulate during questioning and provided accurate information during the crime scene reenactment. He also stated that Joseph showed great remorse over what had occurred in private to him. Joseph Arity was eventually ruled to be sane, even though three state psychiatrists acknowledged that Joseph was extremely mentally limited. They referred to Joseph as an imbecile, an actual medical term at the time. Joseph's IQ was a 46, and his mind was that of a six-year-old child. How someone like him could be deemed fit to stand trial is beyond me. It was also stated that he was unable to recognize right and wrong, meaning he was unable to reform any actions with a criminal intent. During the trial, Joseph's lawyer allowed the prosecutors to ask him numerous questions, including one about whether or not he had ever seen a hatchet. Joseph didn't know what one was, or even what one looked like. He did not know who George Washington was, and he didn't know how to distinguish the difference between a nickel and a dime. During further questioning within the trial, it came to light that Joseph didn't know who Dorothy or Barbara Drain even were. There was little actual evidence to prove within a reasonable doubt that Joseph Arity had committed the crimes he was being accused of. Even so, 
on April 17th, Joseph Arity was found guilty. This guilty verdict came about primarily because of his false confession. Joseph Arity would be sentenced to death. While going through the appeals process, Joseph was often found playing with the toy train that he had received as a present from the prison warden, Roy Best. Roy would later state that Joseph was the happiest prisoner he had ever had on death row. Joseph was liked and treated well by both prisoners and guards. The prison warden, Roy Best, would eventually become a supporter of Joseph's, joining in on the efforts to save his life. It is said that Roy cared for Joseph like he was his own son, providing him with gifts, toys, picture books, and crayons. The saddest aspect of this case was that Joseph didn't even have a full understanding of what was going to happen to him. That now brings us to the morning of January 6, 1939. Just a few hours before his execution that same evening, Joseph Arity received an unscheduled final visitation from his family, which had been arranged as a surprise by Warden Best. Joseph's father had passed away in February of 1937, and he had not been able to attend his funeral. Joseph had not seen his mother since his incarceration, and it was said that Joseph displayed an emotional numbness through the 15-minute visit he had with his family. The only time Joseph showed any emotion was when a three-gallon bucket of ice cream was brought out for him and his family to eat together. When Joseph was questioned about his upcoming execution, he clearly did not understand what was about to happen. He was allowed a final meal, which ended up being some more ice cream. In fact, he didn't even finish his ice cream. He asked for it to be refrigerated so that he could eat it later on, not realizing that there was no later on. Roy Best would accompany Joseph on his walk to the gas chamber, talking about the prison chicken coop on the way there. It is reported that Joseph smiled before he entered the chamber. There, Joseph was given his last rites before being blindfolded. The blindfold upset him temporarily, but Roy Best grabbed his hand and reassured him, finally calming Joseph down. Roy Best was said to have been in tears during the entire ordeal, pleading with the governor of Colorado to commute Joseph's sentence before the execution. But no matter how much Roy Best pled, Teller Ammons, the governor of Colorado, refused to commute Joseph's sentence or to pardon him. With no pardon coming, there was nothing else that Roy could do. He would sit back and watch as the gas would soon fill the chamber and Joseph Arity's life would end. Now, this case is a tragic and heartbreaking one, especially knowing what we know now, that Joseph Arity was 100% innocent. At the time of his forced confession, another man named Frank Aguilar had already been arrested as the prime suspect in this case. I won't dive into all of the details, but Aguilar had worked for the father of the two drain girls. To put it simply, the police decided to place the blame on both Joseph and Aguilar. The police would later state that Frank and Joseph had met by chance and carried out the attacks together. Frank Aguilar would claim that Joseph was in on it but his account was later recanted as he stated that his life was threatened by Police Chief Grady if he didn't implicate Joseph Arity. In reality, Frank Aguilar was the only one who should have paid for this crime. He confessed, and ultimately the evidence pointed in his direction. Investigators would find an axe head with notches matching the wounds inflicted on both drain girls, as well as a calendar with the date August 15th marked. Investigators also found newspaper clippings containing articles about sex slangs taped to the surrounding wallpaper. Frank Aguilar was later tried for the same crime Joseph Arity was tried for. He was sentenced to death row, and on August 13th of 1937, Frank Aguilar's life was ended. It would take decades, but eventually, Joseph Arity's case would be one that received new attention in the face of research into ensuring just interrogations and confessions are obtained. The U.S. Supreme Court would later rule that capital punishment was unconstitutional for convicted people who are mentally disabled. Attorney David A. Martinez would get involved in Joseph Arity's case. 
He relied heavily on Robert Perucci's book about Arity's case, while also doing his own research. He would prepare a 400-page petition for pardon. In 2011, Governor Bill Ritter would finally give Joseph Arity a full and unconditional pardon. He stated, Pardoning Joe Arity cannot undo this tragic event in Colorado history. It is in the interests of justice and simple decency, however, to restore his good name. This is a tragic story of a man being abused by society and the justice system every step of the way. Joseph Arity was treated poorly because of his mental disabilities, something that all too often occurred throughout history. My deepest condolences go out to Joseph Arity, his family, his friends, and all those that fought over the years to finally clear his good name. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. If you enjoy the content, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, if you want to make sure you don't ever miss a new upload, you can turn on the bell notifications after you subscribe. In the description box below, you will find a link to my merch store and a link to the Cellar Dwellers membership tier for the channel. If you're interested, please take a moment to check those things out. If you'd like to submit your own scary story or a story recommendation, you can do so using the email linked in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself, so anything you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar.